kind of talked about your your recent um, paper that's just um, been released. Um, um, what what essentially is the new information contained in this latest paper? Well, I mean, we we set set out to do this before the before the outbreak, really before COVID. We our strategy was we knew you know we got an inkling from the work in China that these viruses are getting into human populations. And um, we'd applied to NIH to, for funding to work within the Southeast Asia context, not just China, to say, well, look, if that's true, if, there's, if, there's, if these viruses are spilling over, um, is it possible that there's enough spillover that you can actually catch it? You can go to clinics and you can get ready for people who come in with a severe respiratory infection or a you know, neurological syndromes or whatever it is and, and catch these viruses before they begin to spread. So to do that, you know, we got funded and we, we, we started work. And before we go out and start looking at where to, to do the surveillance for people, we need to know where the, the, highest, the highest probability of catching these outbreaks are. So we needed to somehow get a predictive map of where the next spillover event is going to be. So that's the reason we did it. I think that's the big value for us. We've now got maps where we can say, here is an incredibly hot, hot spot where there's just all the right mixture. You've got these bats that we know carry sars related viruses. We've got very dense populations of people and they're doing the behaviors that we know drive risk. But then we realized because we had some a very small, uh, limited pilot studies uh, with antibody data, serology data, you know, we started thinking, is there a way we can predict how many people we should expect to find in, in a hotspot getting infected every year? And it, this all came to a head during, you know, the COVID outbreak when you start to look at um, why these events, they seem quite rare. You know, SARS was over 10 years ago, and then we get covid if, if we get an antibody prevalence in villages of up to two, two and a half, even three percent, what are most of these outbreaks like? Are, are they not even outbreaks? Are they just single infections? Are they people who don't even know they're ill? Um, and can we find out where those cases are and start looking at it? So um, we then work with the antibody data and try to extrapolate. If you've got three percent infected um, in a spot survey, some of them were infected yesterday, some were, inf oh, not yesterday, but a few weeks ago, some were infected a year ago. And the ones that were infected 10 years ago are probably negative because they've lost antibodies. So we looked at how those antibodies wane over time and got a prediction of the annual cases. And I was pretty um, surprised. I mean, when we first did some back of the envelope calculations, we were coming up with you know, really high numbers, like over a million. And eventually, when we did a very rigorous analysis, as good as you can do with the data that are out there, we, we've still got this pretty high number, 400,000 a year, which I think is incredible. And that's just um, bat SARS-related coronaviruses. That doesn't even include the alpha coronaviruses or paramyxoviruses that bats carry. And we know that in Asia, in Southeast Asia, bats have filoviruses because we've seen antibodies to those in people too. So and there's Hanipa, a lot more going on. Hanipaviruses. Yeah, Hanipavirus. I mean, I, I, you know, what, what I find fascinating, and it really, to me, you know, as a scientist, you, you're allowed, you're supposed to get fascinated by this and get excited by this. But on the other hand, it's deadly. And it's, it's just incredible to me that we, you know, we've seen what COVID can do. And yet right now, today, somebody out there in Southeast Asia has just been infected by a bat coronavirus that's different to SARS-CoV-2, it's probably not going to be harmful, but maybe it is. Maybe it's even more lethal. Maybe it's the one, the Delta-like variant that can spread more quickly and cause death. Maybe it's a, a virus that actually kills young people as well as old people. Because, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is devastating, but there could be worse out there. And that's what you know, it keeps me awake at night and it keeps me driving to do this work and get on the ground and do it. Yeah, I was actually wanting to talk to Michael Warraby because um, I thought that his research uh, looking at, at the genesis of COVID-19 and um, the idea that there may have been multiple attempts um, yeah. At, uh, yeah. at, at sustained transmission before that actually happened. I thought that was really interesting too. 
every single emerging disease that we look at, it turns out we either missed cases that were there before, uh, sometimes they've been happening over and over again, or there've been multiple outbreaks that somehow we managed to uh, avoid them becoming pandemics. So you think about HIV as the classic case, you know, it, it clearly spilled over from chimpanzees into people multiple times. And, um, and because it probably because it was in remote areas and the number of people um, connecting didn't allow it to spread as, as quickly. And eventually with globalization, it became pandemic. And, and another, another really pretty shocking example is Nipah virus. When, when we um, started working on Nipah in Malaysia after the outbreak in 1999, we, we started hearing about um, what were called unusual measles, aberrant measles virus outbreaks in India, in, uh, in West Bengal, which is on the border of Bangladesh. And I spoke with folks at CDC, because I worked at CDC for a short period of time, and they told me, oh yeah, that's Nipah. Everyone knows it's Nipah. Um, we all know that the samples have been tested and they're positive for Nipah, but it's too sensitive to make public right now. And sure enough, in the end, it, it was shown to be Nipah. So we started working in Bangladesh, where there were a few cases here and there of Nipah virus at the time, in the early 2000s. And we set up syndromic surveillance in hospitals. And I think we started with three hospitals. And we started finding outbreaks, very small outbreaks, every single year. Um, you know, 10 people in an outbreak. And, and you know, working with Steve Luby at the... Um, Direct Dural Disease Center there. He did really good epidemiology um, and a few others who were working on that. Emily, how can I forget? Emily Gurley. Um, you know, what they showed was that it wasn't just a single case. It was people then infecting others. And we, we even saw chains of about five chains of transmission. So viruses, you know, we, we kind of anthropomorphize and say viruses are trying to spill over, but you know, they're not, they're just being shed by bats over and over again into the environment. We, we know that about 5% of the rhinolophus bats that carry SARS-related SARS coronaviruses, about 5% are positive. There are tens of millions of bats across the countryside. So that's hundreds of thousands of bats flying out every night, defecating, urinating on us, on our, our you know, on our doorstep, on our door handles, on our food, in, on our clothes and we wipe it and we rub our face and we're infected. So to me, it's, in, you know, quite incredible. You know, it feels like they're trying to emerge, but no, they're just being shed. It's like they're raining on us um, and people are getting infected and they're getting infected at pretty high rate. Um, and the, you know, these aren't just exposure to a virus for, for a person to produce IgG antibody. They need to have been infected. The virus needs to have replicated in the body. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think the other big mystery that, that people need to really start looking at is what's the rate of infection versus how many times these become small outbreaks. Probably most of these viruses are of the wrong strain. You know, there are a strain of virus that's never been seen before, but it just happens to be not that transmissible from one person to another. But how often are they? And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's been deaths due to um, COVID SARS related diseases that were missed in this region and even small outbreaks. Um, we saw that with Nipah, that there were outbreaks that were put down to be measles because Nipah looks like measles and measles is common in South Asia. So it was just misdiagnosed. Think about what, COVID, what, what SARS related coronaviruses do. They cause pneumonia when they cause disease. How many cases of pneumonia in Southeast Asia are actually diagnosed? Very, very few. Yeah, no, that just reminded me of, uh, so the way I got into covering um, health and stuff was, uh, did I, have I told you this, that I was a commodities yeah. reporter? I, I was, I've been at Bloomberg yeah, for 21 well, you years. Got, you've got the right um, attire for a commodities reporter. <laughs> I, so I grew up on a farm and, um, and I used to cover soft commodities for Bloomberg and I was moved to Singapore and I was covering, you know, sugar and um, palm oil and all coffee and all oh, kinds cool. of stuff. And then um, when bird flu started spreading, they decided that since uh, poultry were commodities, I had to be the bird flu 
reporter and I knew nothing Very about bird flu. Um, but I certainly learned pretty quickly. I had, um, I was married to a doctor who thought it was inappropriate for lay people to write about medical science. So I decided that I'd, I'd learn more about flu than, than she knew. Um, but, uh, but we, we see that now with heightened surveillance for avian influenza in, in Asia yeah. that we're seeing all kinds of different, um, uh, uh serotypes and, and things, um, uh infecting people and i think we that would have we would have been oblivious to that had we not actually started doing yeah and you know it, it kind of frustrates me as well because you you hear good people who who are medical of of virology people say we need to do a better job at diagnosing undiagnosed illnesses yeah that's true and there are, there are tens of thousands of undiagnosed encephalitis cases every year which is amazing to me but we also need to do a better job at going into communities and talking to people, asking them what behavior they do, and then taking samples from them and seeing what viruses they've been infected by, not just whether it caused an outbreak. Let's get a handle on spillover, how, how frequent it is and what causes it. Because it may turn out that for many of these viruses, there's a very specific sector of the population that's highly exposed. It might be people who live in a certain hotspot. You know, we've got this hotspot map now of SARS-related coronaviruses. They're the communities we're going to be working in. It might be people in that community that are farmers because they happen to go out near caves every evening as they're bringing the cattle home and they get exposed. It might be people who, are, who work outside in general. It might be people who do specific activities like hunting wildlife, farming, or even going into caves, digging out the guano, which we've seen. Yeah, I, I suspect it will end up being sort of geographic specific as well. And because we saw like with yeah. Ninko, with the bats sharing, um, like contaminating the syrup from uh, something. I can't remember what tree. Date palm sap. Yeah, it was date yeah. palms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that exposure is through that way as well. Um, do you think that we need to involve more artificial intelligence for... Um, uh, for figuring out the, um, or, or detecting emerging infectious diseases? Well, I, I certainly think, you know, what we've done here is we've used data that are public um, and, and we've modelled it. With you. We've used a very simple mathematical approach and we've crunched some numbers and, and we've done that in a spatial way, spatially explicit, so you can do a map. And we've been doing that for a, a, lot, a, a number of years. Um, we definitely need to refine the, those models but what this paper tells us really importantly is we also need much better data that goes into those models. And everyone knows that, you know, there's this phrase that a model's are only as good as the data that go into it. Um, so what we've been doing at EcoHealth is we do the modeling and the analytics, but we also get on the ground and collect the data. And, and we work with countries where we know it's a high risk of new diseases and try and encourage them to collect data too. So we've been doing a lot recently with behavioral risk questionnaires where you ask people you know in typical anthropologist way um you know what's your typical day you know we have focus groups where we talk about why people eat wildlife um what are the cultural reasons and drivers of that and then we we do surveys and find out how many people what age groups are they young or old are they rich or poor and, and the reason we do all that is because, first of all, you get better information for these models so we can now model a community. And then secondly, you can start to design strategies to actually stop them getting infected because this is all about human behavior at some point. We know that there are these things come from bats, so there's an exposure from bats that is some of it is, is unavoidable. You know, if you live near a bat cave, you're going to get exposed. But if you're hunting wildlife, if you're... Um, visiting um, uh, markets that sell live animals, you're going to be at higher risk. How are we going to break that chain? Because this is something that's ingrained in thousands of years of culture, and you don't do it by banning it. And we know China's closed down the wildlife farms, most of them probably, at least we've been told, and I've, I've heard from some of those farmers that they closed down. But how long for? And, and is that really, is it pushing it underground or... You know, how much is still going on? Because we know in, in rural areas, the, these habits are ancient. Yeah, no, exactly. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our reporting on that. But um, I wanted to ask you before I do that, um, why is um, 
Southern China very well sampled versus um, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam. There seems to be an undersampling in those areas. What's the sort of impediment to, to doing the sorts of sampling? Yeah, that I mean, I really, yeah, I mean, I really think that China, well, China had SARS. We know that SARS emerged in China. And after SARS, there was a big push to not let that happen again. Um, so there, there was a massive um, expansion of influenza, basically influenza surveillance, respiratory disease surveillance, um, a whole series of syndromic approaches. You know, they expanded the, the, the provincial CDCs. Some cities have, like Guangdong has a CDC um, and, uh, and the, the federal CDC. So they did a lot to try and prevent that happening again. And one of the things they did was promote and encourage research on bat coronaviruses. We did a lot too. You know, we we focused a lot of our work in China because we knew it was a hot spot. And we'd actually, we were, you know, we were lucky enough to find bats in Yunnan um, that had very closely related viruses to SARS. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Some of the, you know, as we go back now to look at those, our findings, you're kind of kicking yourself because like our ATG 13 is, I can't remember, but if, if you look at the ones that are closest to SARS-CoV-2, RM102, RATG13, and the, um, there's a couple of others, they're within tens to 100 miles of the borders of Vietnam, Myanmar, and Laos. And the sampling there has been much, much less. So China's a wealthier country, for sure. They've got the infrastructure, they've got the scientists, they've got a very strong... Um, community of scientists who are eager to publish papers in international journals. And that's been developing over the past 30 years to the point now where they, they're out there, they've got their own journals that are, that are competing at an international level. So that drove a lot of research as well. And it's easier to do research in your own country. That's the truth of it. So I think that's the explanation. But yeah, it's a real shame. We need to get into those countries. And that's why we're now working in countries adjacent to uh, southern China. Are those countries sort of willing, or is it a case of we don't want to find anything bad in our backyard? Well, I'll tell you what, those countries are on lockdown. That's part of the problem. I mean, I, you know, my phone call just now was to Malaysia, and they've been on lockdown like like your Melbourne lockdown, but the street is blocked. You know, your street has a block at the end of it with guards, and they've just they've just released the um, block on one of the streets that one of our collaborators works on. Um, so it's really hard to do field work right now. I don't think there's any, I think governments are, are really interested in this. They want to know what the risk is and they want to protect against it. And I think if you, if you talk about this research as reducing, the goal of it is to reduce risk. I think any, um, any government would want to do that for its people. So I'm hoping that there'll be lots more work go on. This isn't about finding viruses and saying this country is a high risk to the rest of the world. This is about finding communities within countries that can be that are at risk and, and trying to block them from getting infected, helping people in those communities reduce their public health. Correct. So identifying the um, behaviours that drive that risk and then... Identifying the places where the bats are, finding the viruses, finding the behaviours that those people do that put them at risk and trying to work with communities to reduce it in a way that works, you know, and what we do with the community work is the first thing we do is we ask, what do you do? What is an average day like? What is an average year like? Um, and why do you do it? What are the incentives? And then work with them to think, what, what are alternatives? If you're, if you're a wildlife hunter, what are the alternatives to that? You know, are, are there some other things you could do that are less risky? And we work with hunters who are now helping guide field teams and uh, do ecotourism, those sorts of things. But, you know, it's really hard and it's case by case. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm just thinking back to a, um, a story I worked on at the start of the pandemic with a colleague in Thailand about the um, the, the people going into caves in Thailand um, and scraping out the guano. Um, and, you know, they're, they're using their bare hands and not wearing face masks. And uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. so, well, yeah. it, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you go back um, 10 years, even five years, most people who are bat biologists around the world uh, we're kind of reluctant to wear face masks and gloves. And I, and I think a lot of them still don't. I mean, I'm sure that's going to change. Um, you know, it, it's, 
you know, if you got a rabies jab, that was considered all, all the protection you need. Um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to change. Yeah, that guano in particular is a high risk activity. Yeah. To what extent do you think this new paper um, informs the likely origins of SARS-CoV-2? Well, I think it says something about it. I mean, we didn't set out to try and get in, you know, do more on this debate over where did SARS-CoV-2 come from. But with that level of spillover, it, it, anything, any other exposure pales into insignificance. So it really does talk to um, these viruses have been spilling over for millennia, ever since we've been on the planet. And the more of us there are, um, the more of us invading wildlife habitat, hunting and eating animals, going to caves to catch them, kill them, eat them, trading them in markets, farming them, the more risk there is of getting infected. So I think it, it does point to the nat so-called natural origin in a very strong way. I mean, you could do a numbers game on this. I'm sure that the, the lab um, leaker folks are going to say, well, of course, you know, yes, there are, there is spillover going on. And one of the spillover risks is lab researchers going into bat caves collecting bats. Well, correct, of course, there's a risk to that. But the difference between the exposures we're looking at in this paper and the lab or field research that goes on in virology is people tend to wear PPE when they're working with um, animals or viruses. Um, and there are very few people that are actually doing that compared to this millions of exposure. I mean, I think I'm going to forget the number, but I'm just going to pull it up because the number struck me as incredible. The 13 Four, million around people. 478 million people living in these hotspots every single day in an area where Southeast Asia, where wildlife hunting, butcher, butchery and eating is very, very common, where trading wildlife is common, where there are wildlife farms, those are the exposures that, um, that are most likely. I mean, the, it's a numbers game, and the number is on, on the side of a natural origin for, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, do you think that the zoonotic um, uh, spillover events are direct from bats to humans, or do you think it's mostly bats to intermediate species to, to humans? How do you think the pathway is going? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a good question, um, because what we look at here is really bat to human contact. And we, we, it's, we're not able, we don't have enough data to really get into the idea of an intermediate host. We don't know where they are. I mean, we, there are no maps of wildlife farms that breed raccoon dogs. Um, there are no numbers, annual production or how many people were there. We know there were 14 million people working in the wildlife farms in China. I do think that the intermediate host is a high risk pathway for sure, but I think it adds to this direct transmission way. We know that some of the viruses we were working on and we found um, closely related to SARS were able to infect human cells in the lab. Uh, we know now famously that um, they were able to infect mice with um, human ACE2 receptors and cause clinical disease in those mice. So, I think that a direct exposure is still highly likely to be driving a lot of these cases. Um, for instance, in the small number of positives we found on those pilot studies, not all of them were hunting and eating wildlife. You know, a lot, a lot of them didn't report any of that behavior. So more work needs to be done. And I think that that is something else the paper points out, exactly the type of work that needs to be done. Can you um, tell me what work does need to be done? Well, I mean, we, we got to this because when we did when we crunched the numbers on how many people are likely infected, we got a very high range at the end of it. You know, the, I'm one sure people found out we, from from one person to 35 million people. That's a huge range. You think, well, what what on earth's going on? So if you look at in the supplementary figures, we've got um, some sort of analysis of that. And basically, what what we do is we set we look at four or five different factors that play into how many people are getting infected. There's, you know, how many, um, what's the density of population there? And we have good numbers on that. What's the, um, um, what's the distribution of bats? We've got really good numbers on that. What's the serology? How many antibody positive people are there? 
Well, that, that's why we don't have great numbers. There's only been a few pilot studies. Unfortunately, no one can get on the ground and do more work yet, but that's, that's um, a weakness. The other weakness is we don't have great data on risk behavior. There are only a few surveys of, you know, do you eat wildlife? Do you hunt here? Do you go to bat caves? Um, so when we do a sensitivity analysis, it, it points to which parts of that set of data are need to be um, tighter. And the, the two bits that, that matter most are the serology and the behavior. So I think that the, the range, that wide range tells us we need better information to fit the model to. And the better information we need specifically are in the serology and in human behavior. We need more people going out into the countryside, working with communities and finding out what they do and whether they got infected or not. And then crunching those numbers and improving the model. What, what I do think, one last point on that, I do think that, you know, it, it can't be interpreted as there's only going to be one person a year infected. That's pretty clearly not going to be the case. What we we think the average is pretty pretty solid actually, and it may even go higher than that. Um, Four hundred thousand sounds like a huge number, but this is a place where there are, and I'll just check the number again. Um, when you when you put all of those maps of bats together, four hundred and seventy eight million people living in that region. It's a very densely populated part of the world. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be. I think it's fascinating to sort of think that there, <clears throat> there may be some cases that are fatal. Um, there may be some yeah. that are even more. And, and by um, the way, the, the fatal cases won't have been in the data set because <clears throat> they won't have been tested. Right. Um, but th there may have been, there may have been viruses e just as infectious as SARS-CoV-2, but oh, they yes. just were. They jumped into people who never managed to transmit them to others, so that they went nowhere. Um, yeah. So it is, uh, it is interesting. I mean, clearly these COVID-like events are not happening all the time, but there is plenty of opportunity for them to happen. Yeah, I think you got to you got to look at a bit like a sort of a, a pyramid, you know, where at the bottom you've got this huge number of people that actually get infected by bat coronaviruses every year. Less of them actually get any symptoms at all, but very mild symptoms and, and brush it off as a cold or a cough. A, a smaller number get sick and go to clinics and get diagnosed as, oh, you've got bacterial pneumonia. Then a very small group infects other people and you get these small chains of, of transmission. And once every few years, you get an outbreak that goes uh, global. Um, so to get to that tip of the pyramid, unfortunately, You've got to look, at, you've got to start from the bottom. You've got to work your way up. You've got to find out who's getting exposed and infected. What are they doing that allows them? Out of those, you've got to look for evidence of sickness. You've got to go to them to clinics and look for evidence of outbreaks and stop those outbreaks. And if you can stop this at the level of individual infections, you've got a much higher chance of stopping the next pandemic than what we our current strategy is. And, and this... You know, this gets to the really big picture. Our current strategy for the next COVID is, oh, don't worry, we've got vaccines and we've got some therapeutics. So if another one emerges, hopefully we can redesign them and adapt them to the new virus. What if we can't? What we saw with this virus is it was sufficiently different to, to SARS that we didn't have the tools to, um, to deal with it. We didn't have the vaccines and drugs. What if another one emerges in five years, that's 30% different, another bad coronavirus. Um, we need to be smarter, smarter than that. We can't be just waiting for these things to happen, hoping we're gonna get a vaccine. And while we wait for the vaccine 12 months, you know, hundreds of thousands of people die. That's not a strategy. That's not, that's not a tactic. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask one last question before I turn off um, the, the recording. Um, and it's to do with the work that you were doing um, prior to COVID um, with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There was the paper that came that was published in October, I think, of 2019, looking at uh, it was that pilot serology study showing um, that a, you know a very small fraction of people were positive yeah, for, 20, for 20, coronavirus antibodies. I think I can't remember now. What was that? Sorry, 2015 or 2016? Yeah, I thought it was 20. I actually. Um, Texted you get out. Uh, <laughs> the paper. 
Oh, no. Oh, you're talking about the um, human, human animal oh, yeah, yeah. and back coronavirus, rural residents and so Correct. on. Yeah, yeah. Published yeah. in uh, uh, online November no, uh, 9th, yes, 2019. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that, that to me, you know, obviously this work that you were, were doing was in trying to understand this risk. Um, and this is this is work that you've been doing for for a very long time, um, and 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 I think that sort of helps understand helps understand you know your um, the reason for why you've been so um, uh, outspoken on this issue yeah. because you've been you know going talking about this for for really since SARS, haven't you? I, I have been talking about it since SARS. No, you're right. I mean, I am outspoken about it because I'm speaking the truth. And as scientists, you need to speak the truth to the public. You, you know, you're paid by the public largely to do this work. You need to give back. And giving back is telling them what you found. And if they don't like the news, sorry, that's what we've got to do. And, and you know, the, we knew after SARS that there was a clear and present danger of, of another pandemic. China knew that. And we worked with them to find out where it's going to come from and which people are going to get it first? And, and are these viruses still out there? We found they were out there. We found they could infect human cells. We found there was a huge diversity of them. Um, we even found, I mean, not our group, but Jung Lee's group, even found some that turn out to be the closest relative for SARS-CoV-2 in a mine where people died, because that's exactly what you should do. If there's a cluster of cases of pneumonia in some miners where probably there are bats, you want to go to that cave, look for bats, try and find the virus that may have killed them. And if you find it, you publish it straight away. Um, so we've been doing this, and I've been speaking uh, as often as I can about it. I mean, I, I've forgotten about the quote, actually, but it's, it resurfaced again from 60 Minutes in um, 2004. I can't, it was a long, long time ago, 2004, where I said I was, you know, what keeps me awake at night is another SARS-like virus that could this time spread globally wiping out people as it goes. Well, we've got that. And it is extremely frustrating to have been saying that for so long. And when it happens, people say, well, it can't possibly have happened through exposure to bats um, in these wildlife farms that you've been talking about all this time, where SARS came from. Maybe you did it. <laughs> that's, that's the ultimate irony. And, you know, I completely understand the, um, the conspiracy theories around the origins of COVID. Um, but, you know, I'm a scientist. I have to address them with the facts that we know and with the, the most parsimonious explanation for those facts. And the most parsimonious explanation, as this paper shows, is hundreds of thousands of people getting exposed every single year with these incredibly diverse viruses that still are to this day, right now, here and now, a risk for the next outbreak.